Okay. All right. Prophet David Taylor here for your weekly live prophetic word. Thank you to everybody that's joining me live. I want to say welcome to everyone on Facebook. Welcome to everyone on Periscope. Welcome to everyone watching me on YouTube. Uh, everyone listening to me on the podcast and anyone watching any replay, anytime, anywhere, at any point. I just want to say thank you and God bless you. And uh, we want to be sure that we receive from the Lord. And the reason it's so important, uh, you hear me say it all the time, but I say it over and over again for first time viewers. And I also say it over and over and over again because repetition is the key to learning. So in other words, it's when you hear things over and over and over again that sometimes they really begin to sink in. You really begin to grab hold of them like you're uh, supposed to. Say hi to my sister. And um, that is that it's why you need the prophetic in your life. God is a person, not a set of rules. One more time, God is a person, not a set of rules. And Jesus already told us in Acts that Father God has a matrix. He has a schematic. He has a blueprint. He has times and seasons mapped out in heaven where he is going to operate according to his purpose and according to his purpose says and according to what Father God wants to do in terms of executing his will in heaven and earth and hell and all three realms, Father God has all that mapped out. And the Lord said, it's not for us to know the times and the seasons that the Father has put into his own hand. But when he gets ready to move, okay, when, you get, when he gets ready to move, when he gets ready to do something, then the Bible says that surely the Lord God will do nothing unless he first tell his servants the prophets. So in other words, even though we'll never be privy to that big schematic and you don't want to be, hey, God bless you. So if you want, you don't want to be that because you would explode. Uh, everything in your body would explode. You can't process all that data. You really think that you could stand to see the amount of data that comes before the face of God on a daily basis? Do you, <laughs> do you think that there's any possible way we could process that? No. But when God gets ready to do something, the Bible says that he will tell his servants the prophets. And that's why you need the prophetic in your life. You need to listen to a prophet, but you also need to develop your own prophetic walk with God so that when the Lord is ready to move and do what he's doing, you can get a word from the Lord for yourself. And that's how you stay in step by knowing the written word, the Bible, knowing Jesus personally for yourself, but also knowing the prophetic word. That's why you hear me say that all the time. <clears throat> and if you want to see how that plays out in real life, People that don't have the prophetic are the people that are still doing things in church from 20 and 30 and 40 years ago. They're still trying to sing songs that was anointed back in the 80s and 90s. They're still trying to deal with structures and systems that God has torn down. It's not even part of our lives anymore. And they're still trying to build something old when God has moved on. Because he is a person, he is not a set of rules. And if you try to approach your relationship with God as if it's a set of rules, You'll be trying to do all this stuff instead of hearing what the Lord is saying to you. And remember, that's what the Lord says seven times in the scripture. In the book of Revelation, chapters two and three, every time the Lord is giving grace to a church, he ends that section every single time with these words. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the spirit saith to the church. Seven times the Lord says that. OK, why would the Lord say that seven times if it wasn't important? He wants us to hear what the Holy Ghost is saying to the church. And if you're so busy with your old regimes, your old ways, your traditions of men, well, that's how mom and them did it. Well, that's how my grandparents did it. But well, that's how we did it back in the day. We ain't back in the day. We in 2020. And we're in a time of extreme craziness and extreme judgment. OK, and the judgment of God has been released on the earth and the judgment of God has been released on America. And what we need to know is how do we get out? Not just how do we get through at surviving, but how do we get out? How do we get the Lord to smile upon the land again? What is God wanting us to do so that he can open his hand and release the hand of blessing again so we can get out from underneath all this craziness, all this death in the streets 
and all this violence and all these miscarriages of justice and all this sickness and all this pestilence and all these runs on food and everything we've been dealing with. Is there a way out? Yes, there is. Okay. And that's part of what the prophetic word is for today. So we're going to say a quick word of prayer and we're going to jump right in. Thank you, Lord, for your kindness. Thank you, Father God, for your mercy. Thank you, Father, for Jesus, for sending Jesus to pay the price for all wrong, wrong that's done to us and wrong that we've done and just sin itself. Thank you, Jesus, for your shed blood. We strip ourselves of any notions of self-righteousness, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to your mercy, oh God, you saved us. So we come to you, Father, in Jesus' name, on the strength of his righteousness, his name. Speak through me, O oh God, fill me with your spirit. I surrender my entire self to you, my lips, my mouth, my hands. Breathe through me, O oh God, so that your message can come forth, so that you might be glorified in all things, so that the prophetic word you want on the earth for today will be released. And I declare and decree that signs and wonders and miracles shall follow this word, and all that receive it will see your mighty hand operating in their life this day. In Jesus' name we pray and we declare and decree it by faith. Amen and amen. All right. Today's prophetic word is restoration of family. Say that again. Put that on screen. Today's prophetic word is restoration of family. I got to give you a little warm up and then we'll look at the scriptures and then we'll let the Holy Ghost show us what he wants us to know. Because remember, there's always practicality in the prophetic. In other words, God's going to tell you what to do. <laughs> it won't be just a word of rebuke or correction or warning, whatever. God's going to give you actually something to do. So let me give you the warm up. Uh, the warm up to what I was saying is what I was saying before I prayed. And that is that the judgments of God are upon the earth because God is not pleased with the choices we've made as a nation, as a people, as humans. People say, oh, that's not true. God is too loving. God is too, is, you know, not kind. All this stuff is random. That's not true. That's not true because he's done it before. Remember, that's the story of Noah. It's not a story, it's history. God got so disgusted with us humans. He looked at us, looked at us and said that the thoughts of our hearts were continually evil from the time we were young, from our youth up. And he was sorry he made people. All that's in Genesis. And God told Noah that he was going to destroy mankind. But Noah found grace. Noah knew how to go before God and not stand on his own righteousness, but stand on God's goodness. And that's how Noah found favor and built the ark and saved the world. God wiped us all out. He wiped all the humans out down to one family of eight. It was Noah and his wife, his three sons and their wives. That's eight people. Those are the only people that were left on earth during the time of the flood, because God was so unhappy with humanity, he wiped us all out. So don't listen to people that tell you that God's love uh, superimposes over his holiness or that there's any kind of conflict between God's love and God's wrath. God's wrath is the anger of hurt love. God's wrath is the anger of offended holiness. God does everything to be good to us, God does everything to give us a chance to love him, know him, serve him. God tells us to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the, replenish the earth. In other words, every commandment that God gives us is good. And then we reject it. And then we throw it out and then we tell God, we don't want none of that. We're going to do things our way. And then now you're provoking God to wrath. And you heard me say it last week. Now, unconfessed sin before God is like garbage you haven't taken out of your house. And eventually that stench is going to get you. You can't take it anymore. And that's what's happening in heaven right now is the stench of our sins as humanity have gotten into the nostrils of God and judgment has been released on the globe and on us as a nation in America. If and since that's the case, then what we might want to know is, OK, God, how do we get out? Is there a way to become pleasing again in your sight so that you're great and mighty and justified wrath might be lifted and that you might smile on the land and bless the land and heal the land. And the answer to that question is, yes, there is. Now, I've spoken on this before, but the Holy Ghost told me to zoom in on this today. There's about five or six things that the Lord told us that he wants us to do. 
There's about five or six things, and it's in an earlier video I did on my page if you want to hear all, hear all five or six. I'm just talking about one a day. There's about five or six things that the Lord released months ago that he wants to happen this year that we need to get into. So you need to watch that video. Um, uh, I think it was a No More Genius video, or I think it was one of these live videos. But I have talked about this before. But today, the Holy Ghost told me just to zoom in on this particular one. So understand, as we go into Restoration of Family, this is just one out of about five things we need to do to get right with God and to get this judgment lifted off of us, okay? This is just one of them. But today, we're going to look at Restoration of the Family. So our first scripture that we're going to look at is we're going to look at the book of Malachi. Now, the book of Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament. Malachi is not chronologically the last prophet. The last prophet to prophesy was actually uh, Zephaniah. And it has to do with the Hebrews that were coming back from the Babylonian captivity. Because the order that we see in the scriptures is not actually chronological. There's a lot of prophets that were contemporaries. They were prophesying at the same time. So when you see the order in the scripture, do not take that as chronological order. You have to study it. So Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament, but chronologically Zephaniah was the last prophet, but it might be the last book in the Old Testament because of the last thing it says. It's the last word we have in the Old Testament. So maybe that's why the Holy Spirit had them put it where it was. And we're going to see that right now. So we're going to look at Malachi. We're going to look at chapter four, verses five and six. We're going to look at Malachi chapter four, verses five and six. Now, you might be familiar with these scriptures. This might be the first time in life, your life you're hearing them. Okay, so listen carefully. If you've heard them before, Holy Ghost is going to show us some new stuff. If you haven't heard them, then please listen carefully. Because this is one of the ways out. Okay. Malachi 4 and 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. New Living Translation. Look, I'm sending you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord arrives. New International Version. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. Okay. So let me say right off the bat, God just told you he's going to send a prophet. There is yet one more reason why you need to have the prophetic in your life. Don't listen to these people. I don't care if they got more degrees in a thermometer. I don't care what kind of royal robes they have on. I don't care what type of re religious regalia they brandish. Do not listen to these people that tell you there's no such thing as apostles and prophets today. That is incorrect. And God has said that, okay, now when the Bible talks about the day of the Lord, when the Bible uses that phrase, you've heard me say it before, that phrase is talking about judgment. In other words, God is already foretelling you that there's going to come a day where he shows up to judge. He's going to judge the earth. He's going to judge the nations. He's going to judge us individually. He's going to judge families. He's going to judge groups of people. He already tells us that in the scripture. Well, that's what the Bible means when it says the day of the Lord. So in other words, God is saying, I'm going to let you have however many days you get. And then God saying, I'm going to have my day. <laughs> so that's why sometimes people make the mistake. And you heard, you've heard me say it before. Sometimes people make the mistake of thinking that because God hasn't said anything, that he's not watching. That because God hasn't said anything yet, that he's not doing anything. You know what he's actually doing? He's writing stuff down. He's writing your stuff down. He's writing down what you say. He's writing down what you do. And he's writing down the motives in your heart, why you do what you do. And he has all that recorded in books. And he will give you however much time as he designates to give you. Nobody knows that. But the day is going to come where it becomes the day of the Lord. God says, it's my turn now. And the Lord is going to show up with the records of your choices. And he's going to judge you out of the records of your choices, individually, as a family, as a group of people like black people, uh, as a nation, a kindred tongue people and nation. He's going to judge us. He's going to have his day. So that's why people get confused because they think that they just get all the days they want and there's never going to be an answer. 
That's incorrect. So God says here that I'm going to send you a prophet. Now, what does it mean when he says he's going to send Elijah? Does he mean he will literally send the Elijah that was in the Bible? Remember, there's also two other people in the Bible named Elijah, not just the main Elijah's prophet. That's not what that means. He means the spirit of Elijah. Okay. He means a miracle worker. He means someone that's going to pass the mantle. He means someone that uh, when you read Elijah's life, starting at 1 Kings 17, I believe, the first thing that Elijah does when he comes on the scene is he shuts up the heavens. He said, ain't going to be no rain till I say different. <laughs> See, Elijah is trying to call the attention of the king and the people to their sin against God. That's what Elijah does. Elijah says, you are under judgment because <laughs> you're not paying attention to what the Lord God Almighty is saying. So the Lord said, I'm going to send you that spirit. I'm going to send you someone in that spirit, in that vein, to call out your sin, to point out to you that God is not pleased with your choices, and to tell you why there is judgment on you. That's what Elijah did. Okay? I want to read it to you right quick since I brought it up that way. Okay? Uh, 1 Kings 17 uh, verse one. Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe and Gilead said to Ahab, Ahab was the king, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years, except at my word. That's first Kings 17, one, uh, New International Version. The shedding up of the heavens, no rain, no moisture, no dew, they always understood was a sign of judgment, dropped. But God says, I'm not going to give any water to the land. I'm not going to give any rain to the land. I'm not going to give any moisture to the land, which is going to mess up your crops. That's the first verse uh, about Elijah in the entire Bible. When Elijah shows up on the scene, he coming in with judgment. <laughs> he coming in putting Ahab in check. So God <laughs> says, I'm going to send you someone with that spirit before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord, dreadful day of the Lord. A terrible day of the Lord. That word translated there, that phrase means to fear, to revere, to frighten. A, a primitive root to fear morally, to revere, causality to frighten. So in other words, you need to have the fear of God. You need to understand that the day of the Lord is something to be afraid of. When God tells you, I'm going to show up with my books and records, and I'm going to show up with everything you said and everything you've done, and every motive in your heart when you did it. And I'm going to judge you accordingly. You need to be afraid of that. And you need to live your life in anticipation of that day so that when the Lord shows up with his records of your life, he, he'll open his books. And if he likes what he sees, he'll say, well done, good and faithful servant. And open up a blessing. And if he doesn't like what he sees, he might call you wicked and lazy. He might cut off your bloodline. A whole lot of stuff might have happened. So the Lord says he's going to send you someone with the spirit of Elijah to let you know that God says, before I have my day, I'm going to send a prophet to you to let you know what's up, to let you know why there's judgment in the land, to let you know why I've closed my hand or I've opened the hand of judgment, to let you know how you are not in line with me. That's the spirit of Elijah. And to work miracles, to do stuff that no human hand could do, to show you under no, uh, with no illusions or delusions that this is the voice of God. This is the hand of God. This is not the hand of man. Okay. That's why we've seen so many signs and wonders in the earth. That's why we've seen so many things happening. If you paid attention, people that are professionals in almost every walk of life keep saying, I've never seen anything like this. I've never seen anything like this. Nurses, doctors, firefighters, uh, pastors, teachers, mayors, they keep saying, I've never seen anything like this. I've never seen anything like this. You see that? Because God is continually giving us signs and wonders to let us know that this is him. This is beyond the hand of man. This is beyond something that we can do or understand. You understand? So that's the setup. Let's move to the next verse. Next verse is Malachi 4 and 6. So verse five, behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great awesome day of the Lord, verse six, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Otherwise, 
I will come and strike the land with a curse. Oh my word, New International Version. He will turn, he, Elijah, will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents or else I, God, will come and strike the land with total destruction. English Standard Version. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Do you understand what the Lord is saying here? Do you understand that the Lord just explained to us why everything that's going on in America is going on, at least this one aspect? Because remember, I told you, this is just one out of about five things we need to get right. The Lord just told us that the reason he has struck our land with a curse, the reason he has struck our land with destruction is because <clears throat> the hearts of parents, the hearts of fathers are not towards their children and the hearts of children are not towards their parents. What does that mean? That means that we are out of divine order. I'm gonna show you divine order in a minute, but I want you to understand what this means. That means that we are out of order. It means that there has been a breakdown of the family and God is not pleased with it. How can you make a statement like that, Prophet Taylor? Because God is the one that invented the family. Remember, God is the one that made humans. God is the one that made uh, families. And it's the first institution that God made. And I want you to notice that whenever God wanted to establish something, he always established a covenant with a man and his family. Noah. Noah God put Noah in the same position that Adam was in. And God told Noah, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. You do that through family. What did God say to Abraham? He said that he would make of him a great and mighty nation. He was going to multiply his seed. He was going to expand his family. When he brought Ruth into the bloodline of King David and Christ, he brought her into the family and she gave birth to King David's uh, grandfather. And then uh, they traced the lineage of Christ down 14 generations to a family. So how in the world can we think if God keeps moving through families, that if the families are actually in disarray and disorder, that somehow God would God wouldn't be displeased with that. How we can just live any kind of way and think that the creator of heaven and earth is just going to wink at that, is just going to gloss over that. We're wrong. We're wrong. I will read the scripture to you again in case you think I'm making it up. He will turn the hearts of the parents to the children and the hearts of the children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. So if anybody asks you from this day forward, why is our land being destroyed? Why are there fires and why is the sky turning red and why is there pestilence and why are we having a run on? In America, runs at the grocery store, toilet paper and water and flour and anytime you and sugar and anytime you've gone to the store and you see them shelves, they're not just, you know, low, they out to the point of it looked like locusts came through there. <laughs> Ain't nothing on them shelves, but memories people is buying up stuff so fast and hoarding stuff. And a lot of stores now have, you know, limit one, limit two in place. How can that be in the richest country on earth? Because we're dealing with famine and pestilence. That's why we've been struck. And why have we been struck? Let's look at the scripture. He will turn, okay, to turn back, to retreat again, the hearts, the heart, the feelings, the will, the intellect, the center, your core of the fathers, uh, that word there, and he was actually translated father, some translated parents, because it can apply to both parents. Then it says to their children. Then it says uh, above, over, upon, against. It's a preposition, that word too. So in other words, we have no longer made the family a priority. We're making babies and murdering them in the womb. We're making babies and not taking care of them. We're doing whatever we want to do, but we're doing everything but forming families. And remember, now remember, that's what comes along with unlimited sexual freedom. 
as Americans, that's what we like. Americans really want unlimited sexual freedom. We want the freedom to do whatever we want to do sexually. And we fought for many, many years to create a situation that says whatever you want to do sexually, you ought to be able to do it within reason, of course. But, you know, those reasons and boundaries keep getting stretched. But when you do that and you don't form families, do you know what you end up with? You end up with throwaway people, if you didn't know that. Yeah, sex eventually leads to babies, and then babies are going to lead to someone that needs to be taken care of. So you're going to abort the child, or you're going to give away the child, terminate the pregnancy. You might accidentally miscarry. You might give the child for adoption. You might decide to be single parent. You might do a, a whole bunch of things, but the child is still going to have to be dealt with once a life is conceived. And God set up the family like he wanted. I'm going to show you that later. God set up families like he wanted them. And then we keep telling them, no, God, it don't go like that. Okay, that is arrogant, idolatrous blasphemy. That you as a created being made out of clay and breath, sticking your finger in the face of God Almighty, telling them it don't go like that. As if you were God, as if you invented the family, as if you invented men, as if you invented women, as if you invented children. Trying to tell God it don't go that way. That's why our land is being struck right now. And then it also says, it says, it doesn't just say it's going to turn the hearts of the parents to the children. It says it's going to turn the hearts of the children to the parents. Now, let me say here unequivocally, there is this notion that we have that somehow we are not responsible for our behavior because we're young. That is not biblical. <laughs> God didn't say that. God didn't say that. God didn't say that. I just read it to you. God said he's not just looking for dads and moms to form families and take care of the children. He's looking for children to get back in line and revere and respect their parents. See, God sees you when you're young. Don't be listening to those philosophies that tells you between the ages of 13 and 19, your teen years, you can just do whatever you want and it doesn't matter because you're young. That's not true. God ain't ever said that. And so God said he's not just looking for moms and dads to turn to the kids. He said he's looking for the kids to turn to the moms and dads. How? In respect. In reverence, because he said of the Ten Commandments, commandment number five is honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. And the Bible says that is the first commandment we promise. I'm going to read that to you in a minute. So God did not say honor your father and your mother if they're perfect. That's one thing sometimes as kids, I have been both. I have been both the son and the father. I have been my son underneath my dad, and I have been a father over my children. OK, and I know that sometimes because I've been on both sides of the table, I know sometimes as children, what we do is we keep a list of all the things that our parents did wrong. And they did this and they did that and they didn't do this and they should have did this and they did this and they they did that. Even if that is true, because remember, that's just your perspective on things. Remember, there's more than one side to a story. That's just your perspective on your childhood because you might be conveniently ignoring the things that you did. But so many of us as children, we keep lists over against our parents and we normally don't get rid of those lists until we become parents ourselves. <laughs> then when you become a parent yourself, it looks different to you then. Then all of a sudden, when you become the mom, when you become the daddy, but anyway, God did not say to honor your parents if they're perfect. If God said that, then no parents get any honor because no parents are perfect. God never said to honor your father and your mother if they're perfect. That's not in there. God said to honor your father and mother, period, the end. That's where it stops. So that means if you can't find anything good to say, then say something like, I thank my mother for giving me life. I thank my father for giving me life. Praise God that God sent me to those people and made me who I am. OK, because I stop by to tell you, if you don't like your dad, every time you sign your checks, you sign in his name. Without your father, you are a bastard child. You are illegitimate. Every time you sign your checks, you sign in a man's name. I got two kids. I have a daughter and a son. Uh, my son is married. My daughter is not. 
but both of them carry my name. And every time they sign their name, that's my name. They're not bastards because of me. That's my name. That's my name. Okay? And so God does not tell you to honor your parents as soon as they become perfect in your eyes. Now, let me hasten to say, I must give balance to what I just said. That does not give us the right to abuse. And that's what a lot of parents have done. A lot of parents have abused their children because you think you have a right to abuse. You don't. I'm going to read the scripture to you in a minute where God says not to do that. Where God says, if you're a parent, do not abuse your children. Because sometimes we do. And if you have abused your children, you have to repent. You have to confess your sin before God and you have to tell your child, I was wrong. Dad or mom, I was wrong. What I did was wrong. I was wrong. I had no right to treat you that way. Okay, that's in the scripture, but they need to repent too. Talking back at you, turkey necking, rolling a neck, living in your house, but not doing what you say, disrespecting your boundaries, thinking they get to burn your lights and eat your food and just use your resources, but they don't owe you nothing in return. Mm. Mm -mm. No, see, children got some repenting to do too. A lot of the problems that we see with young people now is because they don't have any parenting. And I'm going to show you God's order. I'm going to get there, but I'm just trying to get you to understand what the scripture says. It's the last verse in the Old Testament that God said, if we don't get our family situations together, if we as parents are not turning towards our children and making them a priority and being dad and mom over them, and if children do not honor, respect your father and your mother, and even though not perfect, even though they may have done some very, very wrong things, God still said to honor them because God used those two people to bring you in the world. You are who you are because of the genetic material God used to form you in your mother's womb. And there's things he put in you that you wouldn't have had had you not come through those two people. So if nothing else, you can thank God for, God for that. You ever think about that? I know some of y'all looking at me are busy cussing your mom and your daddy. I know some of y'all, while you're listening to me, I know the spirit of bitterness is rising in you because all you can think about is all that they did wrong. But I also want you to think, I want to challenge your thinking with what about your giftedness? What if you are a really good athlete? What if you are a really good singer? What if you are a really good architect? What if you love animals? What if you're a doctor? Some of that came through your bloodline. Some of the giftedness and the blessedness that you have in you right now is because God sent you through that man and that woman. And some of that stuff that you're walking in right now, you inherited. You inherited because you were born from that man and that woman in particular. And God says to honor that and honor them. God says, I made you through them. So even if they didn't do everything perfectly, you still are who you are because of them two people that I use, says God, to make you you. Give them honor for that if you can't think of any other reason because God said to honor them, not honor them if they were perfect. But God says, if we don't do that, if we don't do that, he's going to strike the whole land. Is the land stricken? You hear me say it almost every week now. This is why I don't listen to people that say that the Bible isn't relevant, the Bible isn't real. Oh, it's old. It's archaic. Uh, it's not, you know, it, it doesn't apply to today. It was written so many thousand years ago, you know, by and anybody that believes it is foolish. Are you living in a stricken land? Is there curses and destruction in the land right now? Yes or no? That answer is yes. Unless you've been off planet for the last year, you've seen everything that's been going on on earth and particularly in America, you've seen everything that's been happening. Why? Because God said the family, remember this is one out of five things, but God says the family order has been broken and God is displeased with it. And God said, you got to get that right or else the whole land is gonna be stricken. Okay, uh, I'll give you this personal anecdote and then I'll read you our next scripture. Uh, several years ago, maybe two, three years back, I don't know how many years. Anyway, me and my son I went out for Father's Day. We always get together on Father's Day. It's, I love it. I, I love that time. 
I told him when we were in the restaurant, I said, son, the scripture says that this thing that we're doing right now, spending time together, me and you, his father and son, is so important to God that he didn't say he would smite a city. He didn't say he would smite a street. He didn't say he would smite a town. He didn't even say he would smite a country. He said he smite the earth. <laughs> God said he would draw back his hand and smite the whole planet. Because God's saying, you need to make sure this relationship is right. He's not just saying that to me. He's saying that to humanity. And I was telling my son that that's how important this relationship is to God. Okay? So that's why you better hear this prophetic word. I read it to you in the scripture. You better hear it. So let me issue this to you, then I'm going to read the next scripture. If your parents are alive, it's time to get right with them. If your children are alive, it's time to get right with them. And if neither one of you want to hear it, then there's going to be some type of chastisement. There's going to be some type of judgment. There's going to be some type of destruction. God might even put you in a situation where y'all need each other. Did you know that? Did you know that God could do that? God might, but you might not have spoken to your parents in years. You might not have spoken to your children in years. God can orchestrate a situation where y'all don't have no choice but to deal with each other. Did you know that? So... Uh, okay, let me answer my sister. My sister said, what if your child says anyone could have brought me in the world? What have any parent done to deserve that? And the answer to that question is, you don't listen to that because God chose to give them to you, even if they don't quite understand why yet. Okay? All right, my sister asked me, what if your child says something to you like, God could have sent me through anybody, but God didn't send it through anybody. He sent them through you. Okay. Again, when you're young and sometimes when you're hurting and sometimes when you still have that list in front of you of all the stuff your parents did wrong to you, it's hard to see past that. It's easy to get into a spirit of anger and rage and bitterness. And many times that's justified. That's understandable because your parents many times didn't do what they should have done. Many times they did drop the ball. They provoked you to anger. I'm going to show you the scripture in just a few minutes. But that being the case, let me help you understand something. We are not above God. And when we fancy ourselves above God, do you understand that that is blasphemy and idolatry? What do I mean by that? I mean that God in heaven will forgive you of your sin if you confess and repent. If you acknowledge your sin before God and you tell God, I want to do differently because I was wrong. God, I've sinned against you. I've sinned against my body. I've sinned against my offspring. Please forgive me. Father God in heaven, please forgive me for my wrong. Please, Jesus, apply your blood to my account and apply your blood to my heart. What's the old hymn? Down at the cross where my Savior died. Down where for cleansing from sin I cried. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. And if you pray that prayer, God in heaven will hear you and forgive you. But sometimes your kids won't. They wrong. Sometimes you won't forgive your spouse. You wrong. Sometimes you won't forgive your kids. Now, if there's abuse happening, now don't misunderstand me. I have to keep what I'm saying in balance. Because too many people have used the Bible to abuse people. That is not what I'm talking about. I'm not saying being abused by your spouse or your parents or your children. That's not what I mean. Because if there's abuse, there needs to be a physical separation. You need to put some distance between yourself and that abusive situation. That God don't mean for you to be abused and beat up. That's not what that means. Parent or child or spouse. That's not what that means. But I mean, if you are of sound mind and you're of sound body and you're still alive, if God can forgive you, then you can forgive them and you can forgive yourself because some parents are angry because they're angry at themselves. Maybe you didn't do what you were supposed to do with your children and you've been mad at yourself. You've been taking it out on them because they're not who you want them to be. But you're ignoring the fact that maybe you weren't a father to them. That's why they are who they are, because you never poured 
any fathering into them. Maybe you weren't a mother to them. That's why they are the way they are. You never poured any mothering into them. But some parents, you mad at yourself. You need to confess your sin before God and then forgive yourself and then forgive your child. If your son is not everything you want him to be, then you need to pour into him, not yell at him all the time. If your daughter is not everything you want her to be, then you need to pour into her. But see, if you won't forgive, and I'm talking about on both sides now, I, I, let me hasten to say, I'm not talking about abuse because you because forgiving abusers uh, releases the debt so you don't have to stay in jail, but you ain't supposed to stay around that abuse. You don't have to let them keep abusing you. That's not what I'm saying. So that's not to take away. That's not what I'm saying. That's what I'm te- not what I'm teaching. Understand that because too many people have used the Bible to justify abuse. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about order, God's order. I'm not talking about abuse. But, you know, sometimes there's been some time has passed. Sometimes you haven't talked to your parents in a while. Sometimes you haven't talked to your children in a while sometimes or whatever. But it's time. It's time. Hear that prophetic word. It's time for parents to reconcile with children and children to reconcile with parents. But here's why. Because if God forgives, how can we do any less? I know you don't like that. I know you don't like it. I know you don't like it. But what you have to do is crucify your pride. You have to crucify your need to be right. You have to crucify your idea of justice because I know you want to punch them. I know you want to say they don't deserve my anything and maybe they don't. But do you understand that God is forgiving you daily of your sin? Do you understand that you are not perfect? Maybe you haven't sinned like your parents but you most definitely have sinned, okay? And if you tell God you're not gonna forgive, then the Bible says very clearly, God not gonna forgive your sin. If you don't wanna forgive, then God's not gonna forgive you. And that means his judgment, the day of the Lord gonna show up on you. So I would suggest, I would admonish, I would encourage, I would exhort you to have a forgiving spirit, to go before the Lord and confess your sins. If you are a child and you have been disrespectful, or if you feel like you didn't do anything and they just abuse you, confess your anger and your bitterness and your need for justice and tell God, I just don't think that's right. I Just the way they treated me, God, wasn't right. Tell the Lord, but then allow God to give you a spirit of forgiveness because if God is willing, see, that's the thing. If you're trying to exalt your judgment above the judgment of God, you're in trouble. If God is willing to forgive, If God is willing to forgive, then you need to be willing to forgive. And God will forgive if we confess and repent. If we agree with God that what we did was wrong, confession. Confession does not just mean saying it, by the way, if you didn't know that. To confess your sins does not just mean say I did this. To confess your sins means to agree with God that what I did was wrong. And then we repent. Repentance means in the Bible to change your mind. It means that God, I realized that the way I was living in this area wasn't right. So now give me a new mind. Let me renew my mind. Let me know your thoughts in this area so I can do that now. You see what I mean? It's time. So let me issue that call. Let me release that into the atmosphere. Let me put that in the air by the Holy Spirit that you need to reconcile with mom and dad and you need to reconcile with your kids if it's at all possible. Why am I saying that? Here's why, because you don't know what's coming. What do I mean by that? What if you get in a situation where you need like a kidney transplant and you haven't spoken to your mother in years and now all of a sudden you're sick. You're dealing with a failing kidney and COVID-19 and riots in the streets and fires and a loss of whatever else. What if your mother's the only person on earth that could save you because she's the only one with a compatible kidney or she's the only one that's willing to give you a kidney, what would you do then? See, you don't know what's coming. What if we get to a point where everybody has to move back home? What if we get to a point where we all have to live in the same house again, at least for a while? What if that happens? I'm not saying it's gonna happen, 
I'm saying it could. And if 2020 hasn't taught you anything yet, it should have taught you by now that you have no idea what's coming around the bend. Hasn't 2020 taught us that yet? So that's what I mean when I say you need to get right with your children and you need to get right with your parents because it could happen before the end of the year. Something go down and you're going to need your dad. And you're going to have to come crawling back to him instead you could have just walked and said, Dad, I want to reestablish our relationship and I still feel this way and I still feel that way, but I'm willing to talk it out or, you know what, Dad, I really want to forgive you. And Maybe you can tell me why. Why did you leave us? Why did you abandon us? Why did you why did you do what you did, Dad? Because it, it hurt me and I've been angry with you all this time and I don't understand why you acted that way. Why did you leave us, Mama? Why did you, why did you do that? Let me tell you something else before I go to the next scripture. If you don't do that, do you know what's going to happen? You're going to pay it forward. Oh my goodness. If your parents abused you in any way and you never forgave them, that means you held on to it. If you held on to it, it becomes a part of your soul. If it becomes a part of your soul, you're going to do it to your kids. I'm sorry. I know, I know you don't want to hear that, but if you look at your life and you're honest with yourself, a whole lot of stuff that you said you never do, you ended up repeating. A whole lot of stuff that you faulted your parents for, you did it. You repeated that behavior. That's another byproduct of unforgiveness. Did you know that? Did you know that, that when you hold on to stuff against your parents, you are going to do the, end up doing some of that same stuff to your children? I know you don't think you will. I know you don't think you will. I know you don't think you will, but yes, you will, because you've been holding it all that time. It's in you. It's going to come out of you. Okay? So let me move on and say this. So the next scripture we're going to look at, we're going to look at divine order. Now, let me hasten to say, see, because I know what the critics of the Bible are going to say. The critics of the scriptures are going to talk about how the order of God is not right. It's abusive. It's misogyny. It's abusive to women. It's all the different kind of stuff. People that say that don't know God. God's commandments are love commandments. So when God shows us his order, God is saying this is the maximized way that the family works, not beat people over the head with the scripture. Because there have been so many people that have formed cults and so many religious practices that have abused the word of God. But I'm not talking about that abuse and I'm not talking about people. I'm talking about what the scripture actually says. The loving heavenly father that explain, explains to us, this is how the family works. That's what you need to hear when you need to hear me read these scriptures. Not thinking about all the abuse that's been done because that's people. That's not God. So here's divine family order. We're going to start with Ephesians 5. Okay. Uh, let's start with Ephesians. I want to put the scripture on the screen. Let's start with Ephesians 5. 18 through 33, because that's where we're going now, okay? Ephesians 5, 18 to 33. And be not drunk with wine, who in his excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Why is that important? Because God says you need to be spirit filled. You need to be working on your internal self-talk, your vertical relationship with me. And you need to always be thankful. And then it says you submit yourself one to another because of him. See, there it is. We do it because he says do it, not because people are perfect. Because you ain't going to never have a good marriage. And you ain't going to never have a good relationship with your children, respect and perfection. If children expect perfect parents, you're going to be disappointed. If the parents expect perfect children, you're going to be disappointed. If the husband expects a perfect wife, you're going to be disappointed. If the wife expects a perfect husband, you're going to be disappointed. We don't. The Bible tells us we don't do what we do because of that other person. We do what we do in the fear of God. We do that because we love and reverence him. Verse 22, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. So God just told you that wives are in the submissive position. He also told you that men, husbands, are in the headship position. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. That's not for abuse. It says that Christ is the head of the church. So let me ask you a question. 
Does the Lord abuse us? Then why do people think that husbands being in a headship position is a license for abuse? It says, even as Christ is the head of the church. If that's the model, <laughs> then see them as religious people that have been abusing the scripture. That's not what the Lord, because it's right there in the Bible, I just read it to you. Even as Christ is the head of the church. So let me ask you a question. Does Jesus abuse you? No, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. He's gentle and kind and he's the good shepherd. And he leads us into the green grass, into the still waters, into the green pasture. The Lord does not abuse us. He might chastise us, but that's because we need to be put in check. But that's so we can grow and become better. Okay? So he's the head of the church. Okay? Verse 25, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but it should, that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth it and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. So God had quite a bit to say to men. He said to love your wife as Jesus loves the church and gave him, like the Lord gave himself for us, we give ourselves for them. To sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, because your wife needs your words. By presenting himself a glorious church, this is a lot. You know, I can't explain all this in a few minutes. But verse 28, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. Now, can you see right there that God is not talking about men abusing their wives? So if that's happened, that's not from God. <laughs> that's what you need to understand. I know a whole lot of people have problems with that. I don't care. This is the word of God. If you don't like it, then you have to take it up with the maker. But the problem you have is the abuse you've seen. That's not God. <laughs> Excuse me, that's people. Because God says right here that, that uh, you don't hate your own flesh, but you nourish it and you cherish it. And you ought to love your wife as you love your own body. So all that abuse is not from God. So stop thinking that these scriptures are giving anybody in the family a license to abuse. That's not what this is. Verse 32. Excuse me, I didn't mean to burp. <laughs> Verse 32, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, that every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. So there's the order. Men, husbands are in the headship position. Women are in the submissive position. Men are to uh, love as their own bodies. And wives are to submit as unto Christ and reverence her husband. But then I'm going to bounce over to uh, Ephesians 6. And we're going to read uh, verses 6, 1 through 4, and I'm going to close on that. Ephesians 6, 1 through 4. Okay, I'm going to say, yes, it says forgiveness is the key here. Yes, forgiveness is the key. So I'm going to put Ephesians 6, 1 through 4 on the screen. So let me read that for you right quick. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Ephesians 6, 1 through 4. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment of the promise. There it is, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on earth. There it is. But here's verse 4. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Oh, Lord have mercy. I could do a whole thing just on that. When it says provoke not your children to wrath, how have we provoked our children to wrath? When you make them feel like they can't ever do anything right. When you mad at the, the other parent and you take it out on the child. You can't tell me we don't do that sometimes. Sometimes you're so mad at the mama, you take it out at the child, on the child. Sometimes you're so mad at the daddy, you take it out on the child. That's provoking them to wrath. What did the child do? What did they do to deserve all that anger and frustration and bitterness you got? Because you're mad at the other parent. That's not the child's fault. But some of us do that all the time. It says, provoke not your children to wrath. What's another way that you provoke your children to wrath? I'll tell you how. You let them get grown and you ain't taught them nothing. 
I don't care how much you spoil your children when they're young. If you let them kids get grown and you didn't teach them how to be grown, they going to hate you. Because it's embarrassing when you get grown and you realize you don't know how to be grown. They let you be a child too long. They let you be a child your whole life, never taught you nothing. Let you do whatever you wanted to do. And now that you're an adult, you don't know how to adult. You're going to resent your parents. See, all that. See, there's more, uh, but I, I'm closing up here soon. But there's more. There's more ways that we provoke our children around. God specifically and explicitly tells us not to do that. So how can we be blaming God for all this abuse? It's not God. It's us actually not doing what God said. Do you understand? So, so to summarize everything, that if we want the judgment of God to move off of our families, off of our lives, off of our land, off of everything we're dealing with, then what we must do, it, one of the things we must do is we must reconcile our family relationships and we have to get back in the proper order. Uh, husbands are in that, well, Christ is the spiritual head over everybody in heaven. So Christ is the spiritual head and then Christ gives commandments to everybody in the family. So to the men, we are in the headship position. I read you all the stuff God tells us to do. To the women, the wives, they are in the submissive position. I read you all the stuff God told women to do. And then children are in the obedience position. Headship, submission, obedience. Husbands, wives, children, all with Christ first. Men under Christ, women under Christ, and husbands, children under Christ, daddy and mama. So children actually have a triple layer of protection. Children have Jesus, daddy and mama, because you need that. Because you don't know when you're a child that there's a devil out there and that devil is waiting for you at the tree. You don't know when you're a child that every smile ain't friendly and all that glitters ain't gold, okay? And everybody talking about God don't know him and everybody singing about heaven ain't going. You don't know that yet when you're a child. So God gives you a triple layer of protection. He tells you to obey. Stay your behind in the child's position. And African-American families, old school, when I grew up, they were really big on that. They were really big on telling you to stay in a child's position, stay in a child's place. You don't do grown stuff until you are grown. Can you see that? So again, obviously I'm just scratching the surface because all of these verses could take exegesis, each one of them by themselves. But I'm saying what the Holy Ghost told me to release today was that this is what we need to be working on if we want the plague and all the trouble to be lifted off of our land. God is not pleased with our family situations. And now is the time, and I can't stress this enough because this keeps coming in my spirit. And by this time in my prophetic career, I know what that means. I know that if the Lord and the Holy Ghost is pressing something on you in the now, that means there's going to be some point in the future where you're going to need that thing he was trying to point out to you before. So this is the end of September. And if the Holy Ghost is having me release that message now and pressing it in my spirit, then what that means is that before too long, before too many more days have passed, you're going to wish you had dad and mom. You're going to wish you had your kids. You're going to wish that the family was actually together like it's supposed to be. That's what that means. So don't be foolish and ignore this prophetic word and just keep on living like you've been living. Staying mad at your mom. Staying mad at your dad. Now, here's an interesting question. What if one or both of your parents are dead? What are you supposed to do? Very good question. I'll tell you what to do. Well, uh, there are many techniques. You don't have to use just one technique, but I'll give you two techniques. What you have to do is you have to get it out of your system. One technique is you can sit a chair in a room and pretend that your parent is into, in it and talk to them and say all the things you wanted to say and get it out of your system because you need to get it out so you can forgive them and move on, even though they're in the grave. Because if you're still carrying all that anger and bitterness and hurt, you're still going to pay it forward. You're still in jail of what happened. You might be 60 and they did something wrong to you when you was 10 and you're still mad. That's 50 years of being in jail and they did. Another technique you can use is called the letter writing technique. Okay. And if you don't want to like do the chair technique, you can do a letter writing technique. 
And that technique is where you write a letter to your parents and you say everything that you might want to say. Dear mom, you know, I'm crying as I write this because I'm really angry uh, when I think about all that you did. Or, you know, you mama, you left me when I was little. I never understand why you left me, mama. And I've been hurt my whole, mama, why'd you leave me? Do you understand how bad that hurt me? Do you understand? Blah, 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 and talk about how you feel. Or dad, you know, dad, why did you leave us? Or, you know, dear father, I know you died when I was three years old and I never got a chance to know you, but, you know, I wish I, yeah, I'd had you in my life, whatever. But that's another technique you can use to exercise out of your soul anything that you might be carrying. Mm -hmm. So that's another way, if your parents are dead, you can work through that pain and still get it out of your soul. You can use the chair technique or you can use the letter technique. You can also go to counseling. That's another very effective technique and pay someone professional. I know we'd have to wear masks now, but pay someone professional, or maybe you could do it virtually and just get out what you have to say, pay someone where it's their job to listen to you and counsel you professionally. It really works wonders. Confessing how you feel, it really, it works wonders to help bring health and life to your soul. But the Holy Spirit is pressing upon my spirit to say that now is the time to make that happen. <laughs> <laughs> because that means that if we don't, somewhere soon down the line, you're going to wish you did. What you're going to do if you get in a situation and you need something, like I said, that's genetic based and there's no match except that one parent that you hate, what you're going to do there? You're going to have to swallow your pride if you want to save your life or you're going to die. Is your pride worth your life? If you hate your father and he's alive and you know where he is and you know who he is, but you hate him. What if something happens and you need him physically? Is your pride worth your life? What if it ends up costing you your life? You're going to end up in heaven or hell early because you wouldn't forgive your dad. And the Lord taught me when I was doing my series on the kingdom of heaven and the Lord was teaching me about the parable of the servants, about how the Lord hired some people at the beginning of the day and he hired some people five minutes before quitting time, but he paid them all the same. And the people that he hired early got mad because they thought they were supposed to get more. And the Lord was like, did not pay you what we agreed upon? And the Lord was like, isn't it mine to do with what I will? Can't I pay people what I want? It's my kingdom. It's my payment. I, I can do what I want. The Lord taught me in that teaching that just because we don't forgive people it doesn't mean that god doesn't forgive them i know they sinned against you i know they did you wrong but god forgives is that people don't want to the lord also taught me that just because you hate somebody it doesn't mean that i hate them oh lord when the lord gave me that revelation it changed my whole life the Lord said, you can walk around hating people if you want to. Because, you know, we do that thing with our friends. We do that thing with our friends where if you hate somebody, you think all your friends got to hate them too. <laughs> you think that if you're mad with them, if you out with them, that everybody you call is your friend, that they got to hate them too. They don't. <laughs> some people will out of loyalty to you, to you and some people won't. But the point I'm trying to make is that the Lord was teaching me that he's not like that. See, God is way better than we are. So the Lord was teaching me that you can walk around and hate somebody for 30 years if you want to. It does not mean that Jesus hates them just because you do. You're in jail to something that's 30 years old and God wants to set you free. But I'm telling you, I'm going to say this one more time and we're going to pray and I'm going to close out. If the Holy Ghost is pressing upon me to tell you that now is the time and the season to get right, that means you better do it now. Because maybe maybe as soon as December or as soon as next week in this crazy 2020 we have, 2020 is going to go down in, in history as one of the most insane years this world has ever seen. Before this year is out, it's entirely possible that that very parent that you hate, you might need them. And then you can have to swallow your pride or die. Do you understand that? All right. I'm going to go into that prophetic word for today. I'm going to go into spirit, ask Holy Ghost if there's anything else he wants me to say. Then we're going to pray and close out. 
my sister says I'm going to replay this sermon. That's right, sis. That's that's what to do. Meditate on the scriptures. And don't try to do it in your own strength. Do it in your own strength. That's right. See, because all this, what I'm talking about, is stuff that Christ has to do through us. It's not something we can do. Because you said you're in tears now as you attack this pain. It's very hurtful. I know it's hurtful because you know I've been there. You know I've been there. I mean, brother, you know I've been there. But <clears throat> it's because it's something that Christ has to do with us and through us and in us. It's not something we can do on our own. It, we can't heal ourselves in that regard. We have to let the Lord heal us. We have to let the Lord get in our situation because we can't do it because on our own, we're stubborn, we're proud, we don't like to take responsibility, we like to blame, we don't want to forgive, we got all this big laundry list and you did all this wrong and that may be right. What if God is asking you to forgive? Because you know what the Lord might do? The Lord might give you a laundry list of your sins. What you going to do then? What you going to do if God turn the tables and flip the script and the way you've been dogging your parents, the way you've been putting your parents on blast, the way you've been talking about all the stuff they did wrong, what if God takes a list of your sins? Because remember, I told you, he got a book. What if he takes a list of your sins and then he just lay out your sins in front of you? What you going to do then? What you going to do if you read just exactly what you sow? So that's why we have to learn how to humble ourselves. If it's good enough for God, it ought to be good enough for us. If he's big enough to forgive, then he's big enough to give us the power to forgive, even when we can't forgive in our own strength. That does not justify abuse. That does not mean as the child, if you abuse your parents, that you was right just because you're a child. That ain't what that means. And if you're a parent, it does not mean that what you did to your son or your daughter was right just because you're the mom and daddy. That ain't what that means. What that means is that we need to confess and repent and acknowledge that wrong and turn from it and ask God to wash it with his blood, wash it from our account and wash it from our hearts and give us a new heart and a new spirit that's willing to be a family again. One more time. The blood of Jesus applied to our hearts and applied to our account in heaven, God's record, to wash the sin from our account, to wash the sin from our hearts, and then give us a new heart, a new spirit, where we are willing to be a family again. Do you understand? All right, here we go. Okay, I don't think I got anything, so we're good. So the last thing I'll say is don't let anybody talk you out of this message. That's why I always read the scriptures when I prophesy. So you can read it yourself. So you can see that there is a biblical root to the prophetic ring of word, that it's not just coming out of nowhere. Read the Bible for yourself. That's why I put the scriptures on the screen. Read Malachi 4, 5, and 6. Read Ephesians 5, 18 to the end of the chapter, and then go and read Ephesians 6, 1 through 4, and read it for yourself, and you will see that what God is talking about when he describes the family is love, loving authority, loving submission, sacrifice, respect, obedience, nurturing, admonition, all those, those are good qualities. Those are good things. That's what God actually says in the Bible. Don't be listening to the mean or religious people that took their power and authority and abused it. That was not from God. I probably need to do, do a whole segment on that because there are a lot of people out there. I'm one of them that had to recover from religious abuse, by the way. I haven't told you that part of my life. I had to recover from some religious abuse. So I know what I'm talking about. And it's not easy, but it can be done you can get back to a healthy relationship with God and a healthy relationship with other people, but you need healing. You need healing if you have been abused in the name of God. That was not God nor his will. That was that person or those wicked people or those hurting people doing that to you. That was not what God wanted because that's not what God says in the scripture. And that's why you need to read the scripture for yourself. And that's why you need to Lord, know the Lord for yourself. Okay. All right. Amen. God bless. I know this one was deep and intense, but it's what the Holy Ghost said. And that's what I'm here to say. It's what the Holy Spirit tells me to say. Okay. And the Holy Spirit is saying what he hears Jesus say. 
And Jesus is saying, what he hears the Father say. So we need to be in line with what Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are saying. And they're saying that now's the season. Now's the time to reconcile. Because who knows what's around the corner? And you don't want to wait until your parents die. Or you don't want to, God help you if you lose a child. I would not wish that on anybody. I would not wish the loss of a child on anyone. Because then you're not going to speak to them again on this side. You have to wait till you get over to the glory realm. Okay. All right. Amen. And God bless. Please like and share this video. Uh, please share this as many places as you can because this is the time for family reconciliation. As many people that can see this need to see this so we can get obedient with what the word of God is saying and what the Holy Spirit is saying through the prophetic, okay? All right, <clears throat> amen and God bless. Um, this is the last Sunday in September. So next time I see you, next Sunday will be first Sunday in October. Um, and uh, so now we always took communion. Uh, in my church at first Sunday. So I don't know if communion Sunday is uh, for you first Sunday, but we'll talk some more about that next week. Okay. All right. Amen. And God bless. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you to those of you that are watching me live. Thank you for those of you that are watching on YouTube. Thank you to those of you that are listening to the podcast. Amen. And God bless. Remember to like and share this word and to remember this is the season for our hearts to get right with our kids and for our kids to get right with us so God can lift his judgment his destruction, the curse off the land. Amen, amen, and God bless. Satan tries to threaten, and sickness is his weapon. To fill my days with strife, it cut me off.